Insertional Achilles tendinopathy Insertional Achilles tendinopathy This video has been produced from a book source of international advances in foot and ankle surgery. We want to thank the editor, Amol Saxena, for his exceptional work. Citation, Saxena, A. Editor, 2016. International Advances in Foot and Ankle Surgery. Springer, London. Introduction. Achilles tendinopathy is characterized by pain, impaired performance, and swelling in and around the tendon. Point one, it can be categorized as insertional and non insertional, two distinct disorders with different underlying pathophysiologies and management options. Other terms used as synonymous of non insertional tendinopathy include tendinopathy of the main body of the Achilles tendon and mid portion Achilles tendinopathy. In this chapter, we give a detailed overview of insertional tendinopathy of the Achilles tendon and tendinopathy of the main body of the Achilles tendon. Anatomy The Achilles tendon attaches to the middle and inferior aspects of the posterior calcaneus. The inferior Achilles tendon fibers blend with the proximal attachment of the plantar fascia. The medial and lateral aspects of the tendon insertion have an expansion to these regions of the calcaneus. The medial aspect of the Achilles tendon expansion is thicker. This expansion is important as it keeps the tendon from migrating proximally when significant surgical debridement and detachment is needed. Calcifications of the tendon in this region arise from microtrauma and physiological changes causing calcium to precipitate in a lower pH environment. There is an anatomically occurring retrocalcaneal bursa that is adjacent to the superior posterior calcaneus, anterior to the tendon just prior to its insertion. This upper portion of the calcaneus has smooth fibrocartilage surface in this region. A secondary, adventitious, bursa may occur in areas with more pressure on the tendon, often from constant shoe contact. These bursae occur within the subcutaneous tissue superficial to the Achilles tendon. Insertional Achilles tendinopathy. Ever since Hagland first described pathology with the Achilles insertion in relation to the posterior calcaneus, Five many authors have described surgical solutions for the approximately 10% of patients with recalcitrant symptoms. Non-surgical management of posterior insertional Achilles tendinopathy such as calcific tendinopathy, retrocalcaneal exostoses, and bursitis is successful in approximately 90% of cases. Non-surgical management often consists of a combination of the following. Rest, heel and foot inserts. Physical therapy including rehabilitation exercises such as eccentric strengthening, stretching, night splints and immobilization, along with pharmacological methods though injections should be avoided and the benefits of anti-inflammatories may only be useful in acute situations and in patients with inflammatory conditions. Surgical solutions often consist of resection of the offending exostoses and calcification, degenerated tendon along with reattachment of the acyls tendon. Clinical findings. Typical complaints consist of pain from the posterior aspect of the heel, within and around the Achilles tendon attachment. The posterior heel may be prominent and the insertion, boggy. Swelling posterior laterally may be termed a, pump bump. Boucher and McInnes make a point of outlining the exact area of patient's pain with a, tic-tac-toe, grids so all anatomical structures potentially associated with pathology are considered. In practice, a patient may have a prominent posterior lateral bursa, but also have symptoms superomedially. Patients may have pain on single-legged heel rays, and some may even have an avulsion due to chronic degeneration. Acute avulsion may require more immediate surgical treatment. Symptoms include pain with activity and rest along with redness and swelling when experiencing bursitis. Laboratory investigations to rule out inflammatory arthropathies, particularly seronegative enthesopathies, are undertaken with prolonged bursitis. Rheumatological consultation is obtained in patients in whom inflammatory conditions are suspected, especially if surgery is still being considered. Generally, when considering surgical intervention, Symptoms are getting progressively worse with activity, despite a significant period of rest. In fact, 
Consideration of rest for a period similar to the postoperative recovery is recommended prior to considering surgery for chronic cases. Radiographic studies are helpful. Plain film lateral and zero degrees axial radiographs are most commonly ordered three. Figure. Calcaneal prominence along with tendon calcification is visible. In patients with inflammatory arthropathy, erosions of the posterior and inferior calcaneus are noted. A. Retrocalcaneal exostosis lateral view. B. Zero degree. Axial view showing lateral calcification. C. Insertional tendocalcinosis. MRI examination can further reveal tendon degeneration, bursitis, and cystic changes of the calcaneus, along with ruling out stress fracture. Figure. Diagnostic ultrasound may be helpful in identifying bursitis and tendon degeneration. Various types, cavus, planus, and rectus, of foot morphology have been found with insertional Achilles tendinopathy. A. T1 MRI showing retrocalcaneal exostosis. B. T2 MRI revealing bursitis. Decreased ankle flexibility has also been cited as a cause, but none of these associations have been scientifically validated. Surgical treatment currently has at best level 4 evidence, and primarily includes retrocalcaneal prominence resection with calcific tendon debridement and reattachment of the Achilles tendon with soft endoscopic resection of Haglund's prominence has also been described, but indications for isolated superior calcaneal exostectomy alone are, in the author's opinion, currently limited. Intraoperative photograph shows the burr was placed on the calcaneal prominence, CP. Surgical technique of insertional repair, retrocalcaneal exostectomy surgical treatment involves removal of the exostoses, pathological bursi, remodeling of the posterior heel, excision of the insertional calcification, if present, and tenodesis of the Achilles tendon with soft tissue anchors. The patient is placed in the prone position. Typically local anesthesia is used, often in conjunction with intravenous sedation, but general and spinal anesthesia may be utilized. A tourniquet is typically not used but may be placed on the thigh or on the calf. The incision is curvilinear from superomedial adjacent to the Achilles tendon just above the superior calcaneus, inferiorly, across the posterior heel, staying within skin lines as much as possible, ending in ferrolateral above the plantar skin lines. Figure. Text here the incision is deepened and pathological bursi and the degenerated Achilles tendon is excised. An inverted T approach to go through the Achilles tendon insertion is used, exposing the superior calcaneus and any insertional calcification within the tendon insertion. The insertion calcification, if present, is excised, often with an osteotum, maintaining as much as the tendon expansion as possible. The superior calcaneus is further exposed after excising the retrocalcaneal bursa. This is resected with a curved osteotum from medial to lateral in both cases of retrocalcaneal exostoses, aka pump bump, and insertional calcification, aka AITC. A reciprocating rasp is helpful in smoothing off the rough edges and making a smooth rounded remodeled calcaneus figure. Figure A preoperative and b postoperative achilles insertional repair with retrocalcaneal exostectomy bursectomy after copious irrigation bone wax can be placed on the superior surfaces from medial to lateral to help prevent ectopic bone formation though this occurs in less than 5% of patients four or more years postoperatively the achilles tendon is reattached with suture anchors Generally the number of anchors used ranges from 1 to 4. Figure. Figure. A. B. Suture anchors for Achilles tenodesis, courtesy Arthrex, Inc., used with permission. More anchors are used when more of the insertion needs to be reattached. Absorbable anchors superiorly may be helpful, in case re-resection is needed. Care should be taken to place the suture knots in non-irritating regions. 
Irritation and granulomas from suture has recently been noted to occur in about 3% of Achilles tendon surgeries in general. This can occur with both absorbable and non-absorbable materials. The tendon proximally is repaired first, particularly in cases where tendon debridement is needed. After inferior reattachment with additional locking sutures, subcutaneous sutures with absorbable material are used. The skin is re-approximated with 3-0 nylon. A sterile compression dressing is applied, and the patient is placed in a splint or below-knee cast boot in slight equinus. Patients are seen within the first postoperatively week. Postoperative care. Patients are usually immobilized in a below-knee cast, boot non-weight-bearing, for four weeks, followed by a weight-bearing period for an additional six weeks. Sutures are removed at two weeks. Patients are advised to take an oral anti-inflammatory, such as indomethacin 75 mg bid or naproxen sodium 500 mg bid, for two weeks post-surgery to prevent ectopic bone formation. Patients are advised to continue elevating and icing the limb for the entire post-operative recovery period. Active ROM is allowed at three weeks working on plantar flexion and inversion, eversion with a towel. Formal physical therapy is initiated around 8 to 10 weeks, though cross-training on a stationary bike is allowed with the boot, cast, again with the heel on the pedal, one week post-surgery while still in a cast, boot. Swimming is allowed, without flip turns, at 6 weeks. Physical therapy includes progressive strengthening, initially with surgical tubing and or a towel at 3 weeks, including single-legged heel raises. Return to daily activities occurs around 12 weeks. Weight-bearing sport activities can take 16 or more weeks. Thank <laughs> you.